Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to our workshop, Leveraging HRSA and HUD Funding to Improve Outcomes for People Who Are Unstably Housed. Lessons Learned from the HRSA SPINS HIV Housing and Employment Project. My name is Serena Rajabian. I'm the co-principal investigator for the evaluation and technical assistance provider housed at Boston University for this SPINS initiative. I'm pleased to be joined by my colleagues from, three, from two demonstration sites, Kristen Lasko from Fenway Community Health Center in Boston, Mass. Kristen is the Director of Housing Services at AIDS Action, the Public Health Division of Fenway Health. She's been with AIDS Action for 12 years and oversees programs providing housing search, rental assistance, and supportive housing. She serves as the Project Manager for Fenway's participation in the SPINS Housing and Employment Project. Precious Jackson from the Pasadena Health Department in Pasadena, California. Precious Jackson is a peer care navigator with the City of Pasadena, Pasadena Public Health Department. Precious has over 28 years of work in the HIV industry, and she's also a woman who's been living with HIV and thriving with HIV for 22 years. Precious comes with an extensive knowledge of HIV prevention, treatment, and care. And our other final presenter today is Guadalupe Lupe Martinez, a housing navigator with Union Station Homeless Services in partnership with the public, Pasadena Public Health Department. Guadalupe has over four years of working with the homeless population. Next slide, please. Um, so we're pleased to share with you our experience with this SPINS initiative. It's an exciting initiative because it's one of the first HRSA initiatives that's examining the impact of social determinants, mainly housing and employment, on people living with HIV and their influence on health outcomes. So today we're going to specifically look at housing and provide our experience with how you can find resources to support people with HIV to address their housing needs. So by the end of the initiative, by the end of the presentation, we hope that you'll be able to first describe housing resources that can support people with HIV, obtain more stable housing. Second, learn strategies to work with HUD programs and Ryan White Planning Councils and other Ryan White funded programs to leverage resources for people who are unstably housed. And third, share tips for setting up coordinated referral systems between provider agencies to address housing needs. Next slide. So again, this is just the, the name of our initiative. Uh, officially, it's called the Improving HIV Health Outcomes Through the Coordination of Supportive Housing and Employment Services that's funded by the special, it's a special projects of national significance funded through HRSA Part F funding. Next slide. And our goals of the initiative, we have four. First of all, it's to strengthen cross-sector cross collaboration mainly housing, employment, medical, and behavioral health systems. Second, we, we aim to improve housing stability, and that's to obtain and maintain safe, affordable housing options for our clients. Third, to increase employment status for people living with HIV, and we do this through building their skills, through vocational rehabilitation programs, education and training programs. We help them achieve temporary and also part and full-time employment. And finally, overall to increase viral suppression. Next slide. So this map shows where our demonstration sites are located and where the intervention models are being implemented. Um, the gray boxes represent the 12 funded demonstration sites of which you'll hear two, from two today. But the 12 sites represent three aid service organizations, four health departments, and five Ryan White Comprehensive Healthcare and HRSA Health Centers across the country. All these sites are mainly in urban areas and serve predominantly urban populations. Next slide. So the eligibility criteria for our SPINS um, program and who's served by the, the various demonstration sites. First of all, it's adults over the age of 18 years or, old, or older. Um, they also must be living with HIV and meet one of the following criteria, that they're either newly diagnosed within the past 12 months, they're not engaged in HIV primary care, meaning they may have fallen out of care, not been seen by a provider in the last um, six months, 
Um, they could be also at risk of falling out of care. That is, they've missed medical appointments um, in the last six months, or that they're not virally suppressed. Also, they would meet the criteria of being homeless or unstably housed. And finally, that they're unemployed or underemployed and that they're seeking employment. Next slide. Um, this shows you by housing status. Um, right now, we're the, the characteristics of the housing status of the clients that we are serving. So we're right now sir, um, have enrolled in a multi-site evaluation over a thousand clients, and um, a, a fair proportion are at baseline. We're currently homeless, so um, a, a very vulnerable population. Another um, forty percent or so are what we considered unstably housed. Uh, these would be people who may be couch surfing, maybe in a transitional program. Um, so in a situation where they don't have a permanent place to live necessarily. Um, another about 10% are either in a, in a situation where they have permanent housing, but they're at, they're at imminent, imminent risk of losing their housing. That is, they may be back on rent, they may have gotten an eviction notice. Um, so that's what we called um, at risk of losing housing. They're also eligible for this initiative. Next slide. So the interventions that are implemented in this initiative um, vary, but all sites, in, all 12 sites in some way, shape or form are for what we call care coordination or navigation. So there's a member of the care team who's specifically helping the clients address their housing needs. And then uh, this is not a medical case manager. So I just want to emphasize that point. This is an, a separate person who's really focusing on housing needs. Uh, the, the initiatives, the interventions also work through system initiatives such as training medical case managers to address housing needs or employment needs. Um, and that can be either across uh, the, the uh, a met, a transitional grant area, across the state, through the clinics. Um, they also work on terms of streamlining referrals. Uh, they work with HOPWA and funded partners to find housing. And then some are also working to um, expand IT capacity. That is primarily looking to integrate housing and um, health or HIV uh, data management systems so that we can better address housing, um, housing needs and monitor those um, needs. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows that the number of our sites that are working in partnership with um, HUD related agencies. So we have about nine sites that um, actually have a partner or the lead organization is a HOPWA uh, recipient, which I'll talk about in a minute if for those of you who aren't familiar with HOPWA programs. Um, but many of our programs have some connection, all the 12 demonstration sites have some partnership with a HUD related program. Next slide. Uh, just briefly too, um, in addition to housing in the initiative, we are also focusing on employment strategies. So um, that works as, for example, some sites are working with Department of Labor workforce organizations to help their clients find employment. Some have started instituting job clubs. Others use employment navigators to help clients individually find jobs. Uh, others, some sites also work on vocational training. And then um, there's also skills building workshops that sites help to provide job training or job, um, job search, interviewing skills, resume support. These are all sort of strategies that are being employed by the SPINS demonstration sites. Next slide. So before we get into our, um, my two colleagues discussing their, um, the ways that they work with housing programs, I just want to um, review a few definitions with folks for those of you who may be new to HUD supported assistance and what sort of assistance might be out there to address housing needs for people living with HIV. Um, by far, um, the largest federal program for people living with HIV is what's known as the Housing Opportunities for People with HIV, or HOPWA funding. And this assists low-income people with HIV and their families with housing needs, 
It can help, for example, um, provide resources to pay costs for securing new housing, help to cover rent, help with utilities. And, and these grants are made to local communities, nonprofits, and states. So, uh, the second program is called um, the Continuum of Care Program. Uh, this promotes community-wide commitment to the goal of ending homelessness for individuals and families. And this funding is directly made um, by HUD to local nonprofit providers, states, and local governments. A third program is called Tenant-Based Rental Assistance, or TBRA, and this assists individual households. It helps them afford housing costs, particularly um, for market rate unit, units. There's also the Rapid Rehousing Program that connects families and individuals who are experiencing homelessness to supportive housing through a package of financial or supportive services like supportive housing case management. And this is a program by HUD that's inf informed by what's known as the Housing First Model, which helps people who are struggling with, um, that need more supportive case management once they are housed, to get housed first and then address other needs such as mental health or substance use treatment that they might have. And then of course, and then the final program that many of you may have heard of are, is the Housing Choice Vouchers. That's also um, known as Section 8. And this can assist local, this is the federal, largest federal program that assists low income families, elderly, and this disabled find safe quality housing programs in private markets. And that a subsidy is actually paid for that housing. Next slide. Um, so also in addition to the HUD assisted programs that are available for people living with HIV, I also just want to call attention to folks that there are Ryan White program funds that provide support for housing needs for your clients. Um, back in 2016, there was a policy clarification that allows um, use of Ryan White funded funds to, to help with housing supports. And this has, um, this allows programs if you're funded by Part A, Part B, Part C or D to help with sort of short term or emergency housing assistance or um, housing referrals such as housing search, placement advocacy, um, fees associated with these services. So um, we encourage you to look up this notification and work with your local Ryan White providers if, um, if there is a housing need in your area. Uh, next slide, please. So now I just wanna turn it over to my colleague, Kristen Lasko at Fenway Community Health Center who will discuss how her program is leveraging housing resources. Kristen? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Serena. Hi, everybody. I'm Kristen Lasko. I'm the Director of Housing Services at AIDS Action Committee. Um, and in the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about Fenway Community Health Center. Um, Fenway Community Health Center uh, is a federally qualified health center. Um, and uh, we're the largest non-hospital provider of uh, medical and behavioral health services to people living with HIV in Massachusetts. And we're a longtime recipient of Ryan White Part A and Part C dollars. Um, in 2013, Fenway Health formed a strategic partnership with AIDS Action Committee, which was the oldest and largest AIDS service organization in New England at the time. Um, and after a five-year partnership, we officially merged together AIDS Action and Fenway Health in 2018. Um, and so now AIDS Action is considered the public health division of Fenway Health. And our services include housing, which of course you'll hear about today, prevention programming, community case management, and a lot of legal services, which goes nicely hand in hand with our housing services. Next slide, please. So within, um, uh, as a participant in this SPINS project on housing and employment, um, we brought a couple of things to the table. One was our Ryan White uh, Part A funded case management at the health center. And then in addition, um, we have a variety of housing programs and housing services funded through HUD, um, where we are assisting clients to access HUD funded and other housing opportunities. So one of our main goals of our SPINS um, initiative was an internal systems strengthening um, between our case management program and our housing team. 
um, we were starting this SPINS project right at almost exactly the same moment as the merger between AIDS Action and Fenway Health was being finalized. So it was a real, a really critical moment for, for all of us and for our programs. Um, so the timing kind of worked out nicely. Um, at the same time, it also presented some barriers um, and some challenges. Uh, dealing with the, the recent merger and all sorts of different systems trying to come together. Um, in addition, um, another barrier that we faced was the fact that um, Fenway Health and the case management program used one data system and still does, their health record. Um, and AIDS Action and our housing programs uses a different system, a client database called ETO Efforts to Outcomes, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Um, and so we looked at some of those barriers and um, have worked toward solutions around them over the past few years through this SPINS project. Um, and that includes granting key staff access to different data systems um, and uh, building and pulling monthly reports um, that will allow our staff to see what's going on um, for our shared clients in different programs. In addition, we have been very faithful to our bi-monthly meeting schedule between our case management and housing uh, supervisors to build uh, you know, a cohesive um, environment there um, that then allows us to um, coordinate between um, the, the programs on the, on the client level. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to take you through um, just the very, very high level of our housing programs at AIDS Action. Our annual total budget is around $4 million, and the vast um, focus of that is uh, rental assistance um, payments, uh, which comprises 40% of our overall budget. So uh, to put all of this Programming together, we're working with 17 different budgets across seven funders. This supports 28 staff members and involves 60 partner agencies across um, the state of Massachusetts. Um, and in the past year, we've served um, 1,097 unique clients um, and a lot of household members who are also not counted in that, in that total. Our services are funded through a variety of sources, including HOPWA from three different places. Um, Ryan White, Part A and B, COC, Continuum of Care funding, and also funding directly from the state of Massachusetts. Next slide, please. And so now I'll give you a little um, uh, taste of each component of our housing programs at AIDS Action. Um, we have three main programs. The first is housing search and advocacy, um, where we're providing direct service to clients who are experiencing homelessness or housing instability. So many of them meet the criteria that Serena mentioned earlier. The second is our rental assistance programs, and this includes short-term financial assistance, as well as the tenant-based rental assistance, or TBRA. Um, so this is serving clients up to 80% of the area median income, which is familiar HOPWA eligibility criteria to some of you. Um, and we assist with back rent, we assist with short-term ongoing um, rental assistance, startup costs, emergency utility payments, and again, the, the longer term TBRA assistance. And then finally, we provide supportive services to clients living in some dedicated supportive housing programs, um, as well as community case management services um, to some of our clients more generally. Um, next slide, please. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, dozens of partner um, agencies across the state of Massachusetts. Um, and so we think of leveraging our um, HUD funded programs um, and our housing programs, along with the HRSA funded case management partners um, across the state to facilitate access for our shared clients um, to the housing programs that AIDS Action offers. Um, so uh, I think it's important to highlight that the housing programs at AIDS Action are here to serve clients um, who receive their care at Fenway Health and also many, many clients who do not receive their care at Fenway Health. Um, so to kind of 
paint the picture, uh, only about 9% of our clients in the past year are Fenway Health patients, it's 103, um, and 994 of um, the clients served by AIDS Actions Housing Programs in the past year actually received their care somewhere else, and it could be anywhere across the state of Massachusetts. Um, so with those numbers in mind, our housing programs clearly rely on partnerships with um, health centers, with hospitals, with other community organizations across the state. Um, and to formalize and um, solidify those relationships, we have memorandums of agreement uh, de detailing the referral process to our programs and the expectations for ongoing coordination, both while the client is enrolled with our services and also often um, for assistance with gathering outcomes information after the client um, has been dismissed from um, our services or has completed their time with our program. Um, we have particularly strong relationships with Ryan White um, funded case management services um, all across the state. Um, and we leverage those relationships um, to identify clients who are in need of our housing services um, through the relationships with our, with our case management partners. So the case managers know the clients. I'm sure this, uh, you know, applies to many of you. Um, you're identifying the client's needs and then the, you're referring the client to, um, to the housing services. Um, next slide, please. So on the program level, um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we're leveraging funds from multiple sources to create a cohesive program. So a really good illustration of this for us is our rental assistance programs and particularly the short term financial assistance um, that we offer. Uh, so this is startup costs and back rent and things along those lines. So in the past year, we've served 744 households and we do that through four funding sources, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, uh, Hopwa, Stromu, and PHP funding from the city of Boston, Hopwa, Stromu, and PHP funding that covers uh, Middlesex and Essex counties, and the Boston Public Health Commission's Ryan White Part A funding. So different geography, different eligibility criteria, um, different you know, data expectations. So we take all that and we put it together and we create a cohesive program with one set of eligibility criteria, one application, um, and one set of expectations across the whole state. Um, and that's really allowed us to um, serve clients across Massachusetts, um, regardless of what their geography means for their eligibility for a particular funder. Um, it also means that we're gathering a lot of data um, so that we're satisfying all of these funders and we have all the information and we can look at the, the program uh, comprehensively. Um, and uh, we are matrixing funding to meet individual client needs, which um, on the next slide I will give an example of. Um, so um, if we have a client um, who um, is in need of rental assistance, um, on the next slide, um, we'll tell you a little bit about that sort of situation. So the client um, uh, needs to access rental assistance, uh, fills out the application with their case manager, maybe a very late night case manager. Um, and we review that application. We usually have some additional conversation with the case manager and the client um, and um, determine from there which sources of funding are appropriate to meet that client's need. So for example, we have a client who lives in Fall River, Massachusetts, which is in the southern part of the state. Um, this falls within the Boston EMA for um, Ryan White Part A, but outside of any of our Hopwell catchment areas. So any of our Hopwell providers are not gonna be an option. The client's referred for rental assistance by the Ryan White case manager and is moving out of homelessness into a new unit with a housing choice voucher. Um, so we would be able to use Ryan White funds to cover the first month's rent and we would be able to use Department of Public Health funds to cover the security deposit. So from the client side and from the landlord side and from the case manager side, it's all one comprehensive package where we're helping the client with first month's rent and security deposit, but uh, on our side, we see that we're able to leverage multiple funding sources to assist this one client. 
Next slide, please. Um, so then another example of how we're leveraging multiple sources is our housing search and advocacy program, which served 308 clients in the past year. And again, we're receiving funds from the Department of Public Health, the City of Boston, HOPWA um, Housing Information Services, and Boston Public Health Commission, Ryan White, Part A. Um, so we are matrixing our Department of Public Health and our HOPWA funding to allow for flexibility in caseload. So most of our staff are um, supported, their salaries are supported through both of those sources, um, which allows us to um, have some flexibility in assigning new clients to their caseloads. Um, and then when it comes to our Ryan White Part A funds, we have one housing navigator position. Um, and we decided to focus that funding on one person uh, to allow for a very small focused caseload um, serving only clients experiencing homelessness and um, really being able to um, hone in on those particular opportunities for people experiencing literal homelessness. Next slide, please. So our housing search and advocacy program um, really focuses on completing applications for housing from a variety of sources, many of which Serena touched on earlier. Um, and those include COC, Housing Choice Voucher Program, Public Housing, um, Project-Based Multifamily and Elderly Disabled Housing, um, HIV Supportive Housing, including but not limited to HOPWA TBRA, um, and state-aided public housing and voucher programs. So in Massachusetts, we're fortunate that we do have some housing that is assisted um, strictly through the state. Um, and then the rest of these programs are, of course, supported by, by federal dollars um, from a variety of sources. So uh, within the, the housing search program, we are assessing the client's eligibility and discussing the options with the client and then um, integrating the plan into the, um, the individual service plan that we complete with each of our clients. Next slide, please. Okay, so then I also wanted to touch a little bit on coordinated access, um, which is um, a new endeavor for, for many of us over the past several years. Um, and we work with a couple of COCs in our area, um, uh, uh, but we spend a lot of time focusing on the city of Boston and the Department of Neighborhood Development, which is the administering agency for the Boston COC. Um, and Within the Boston COC, most of the homeless services agencies have a broad data sharing agreement among them. Unfortunately, due to confidentiality concerns, um, we are not able to participate fully in such a broad agreement. However, we knew that we had clients who need to access um, COC housing opportunities that include HIV specific units. And so we had to figure out a way to connect with the COC while um, preserving our clients' privacy and confidentiality. So we developed a limited data sharing agreement between Fenway and a key staff member at uh, the Department of Neighborhood Development. Um, and this allows us to share information about um, our clients' eligibility. Um, it allows us to review um, lists of chronically homeless um, individuals within the city of Boston and coordinate when we are able to identify some of our own clients on those lists and connect them to um, housing opportunities. It's also facilitated our access to um, the data warehouse um, within Massachusetts um, and specifically within Boston and allows us to confirm and um, pull up documentation of homelessness for many of our clients, which, which is a really key piece in helping them to access many housing programs. Next slide, please. Great. Um, okay, so um, just to take you through kind of a, a client example, trying to pull much of this together. Um, let's say one of our clients receives care at Fenway Health and they're working with a high acuity medical case manager and that case manager's time is funded through Ryan White Part A. The client is experiencing homelessness, which the case manager knows from their needs assessment um, and is staying in a, a Boston shelter at the time um, of that assessment. The medical case manager knows that they can refer the client to the housing search and advocacy program at AIDS Action 
And when the client's enrolled in that program, they're working with a staff member who is, whose time is funded by um, Hopwa Housing Information Services through the city of Boston. Um, the housing search specialist is assessing the client's eligibility, identifying opportunities um, from that list that I mentioned earlier, a variety of different programs, and assisting the client with applications for those opportunities. Um, at the same time, they're working with the medical case manager to facilitate documentation of disability, which is very often needed um, for housing applications. The housing search specialist obtains a history of homelessness through that data warehouse that I mentioned earlier and connects clients to uh, the client to an HIV specific permanent supportive housing opportunity that is supported by continuum of care funding. And the housing search specialist um, then coordinates the move and ensures that the client is well connected to both P PSH services um, and retaining um, connection with the medical case manager who made the initial referral. Next slide, please. Okay, um, and so uh, in these times, we would be remiss if we didn't say a little bit about how COVID-19 um, has impacted uh, so, so many things. Um, and so in, in our area, as I'm sure is true for many of you, um, we've seen a really a significant increase in demand for homelessness prevention assistance. Um, and within that, a, a huge increase in the amount of assistance needed per household. Um, in order to stabilize their housing situation. Um, many households are new to accessing our programs. We're seeing a lot of referrals for, for new clients. Um, and many of the um, household members, um, sometimes every member of the household do not have a documented immigration status. Um, so that's really showing up as a trend for us. Um, uh, on a, in a more hopeful way, <laughs> we're also seeing a lot of opportunities for flexibility, um, including the use of electronic signatures to complete applications for assistance um, and some new funding, um, including through the CARES Act, to support our clients um, to supplement um, our existing programming. Um, and finally, we have unfortunately seen some in increase in the housing instability for our clients who are doubled up um, and uh, couch surfing and delays and in inspections for clients looking to get into new units. Um, and we are um, hopeful that we can use some of our CARES Act funding um, in, in flexible and adaptable ways to, um, to alleviate some of those barriers moving forward. Next slide, please. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Lupe and Precious to tell us about the wonderful work that they're doing in Pasadena. Okay, I was mute to y'all, sorry about that. <laughs> How's everyone doing? My name is Precious and uh, my um, coworker Lupe and I, we're gonna discuss the wonderful work that we're doing out here on the West Coast in Pasadena. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we use the, we utilize the uh, coordinated entry system, uh, which is the acuity score to leverage housing. And so the coordinated entry system uses the acuity scores to prioritize the most vulnerable for housing. Usually um, they have to score 12 and above in order to be um, prioritized. Now, if they're below 12, then um, they're, um, sent to a different type of uh, housing, which is mainly like rapid rehousing. Um, also, if the person, if the clients are HIV positive, they're automatically pushed to the top, uh, especially if they've been sleeping out in the elements. Um, uh, so that pushes their priority more higher. Next slide. So um, when we applied for this grant, we were thinking outside the box and we wanted to partner with a organization um, that did not normally uh, provide HIV services. So we decided that we wanted to partner with Union Station Homeless Services who traditionally um, don't offer HIV uh, services for their clients, but they may have um, HIV clients, but they just don't have specific programs. So um, 
We also partner with them because they are the uh, lead agency for the coordinated entry system uh, for service, uh, service planning area three, uh, which is the San Gabriel Valley area. Uh, and they receive monies from Los Angeles Homeless um, Housing Authority, Los Angeles Homeless Authority, which is LASA, and who receive their funding from HUD and any other resources. Lupe, did you want to add anything to that? You want to add anything, Lupe? Uh, no, actually, I don't have anything to add at the moment. Okay. <laughs> Next slide. All right, so um, these are the various uh, housing agencies that we partner with, uh, Rapid Rehousing, uh, which is also a partner of, um, of Foothill Unity Center, and they also receive money for HUD and also LASA. Uh, we receive, we partner with uh, permanent housing through um, our coordinated entry service, coordinated entry system matcher, uh, and they, uh, she uh, matches them to the high acuity uh, match voucher units. We also partner with Alliance for Housing and Healing, um, Foothill AIDS Project, which is also HOPWA funded, as well as Alliance for Housing and Healing. And they also do emergency uh, voucher, which is a single residency occupancy. We also have a single room occupancy, which is also uh, funded by the city of Pasadena. And then also um, Foothill Unity Center. So these are the like various programs that Union Station works with. Uh, and this is the reason why we partner with uh, Union Station. Next. All right, so some of the barriers that we have found um, uh, doing this program and working with our clients is clients who have incarceration history. So clients who have like felonies uh, regarding like sales of illicit drugs, manufacturing meth or any other, um, or who have a sex offense, uh, it's, very, it's been very hard to find um, housing for those individuals. Um, and sometimes the clients, they tend to get discouraged because of their, because of that particular offense that they may have on their criminal record. So usually for those type of uh, clients, we usually um, encourage them to do shared housing um, with um, uh, shared housing where they have to, uh, where they can split the rent. Um, it's also um, important for clients to inform their housing navigator and or case manager that they have these offenses. Because sometimes um, if they don't, then that's when they'll run into the brick wall. So if they, if they, have, if they tell their um, housing navigator or case manager up front, then there's a possibility, then it makes it much um, easier for the uh, case manager to help them. Because it, it may be, you know, some um, landlords, uh, who will work with um, uh, these type of individuals, especially if they've had offenses like 10, 12 years ago, nothing that's like recent. Um, and also the housing navigator can advocate on their behalf, uh, especially if they change their lifestyle. Now, the other barrier is undocumented clients. Um, so we find that resources targeting this population are extremely scarce, especially because if we want to use the uh, government funding uh, for like HOPWA and things like that, it's very hard uh, to um, place them in permanent housing because they have to be documented. Um, and also uh, providing income verification for client can be very challenging as well uh, because sometimes they like, well, most of them, well, undocumented, they're undocumented, so a lot of times they may work under the table. So they might not have like a, a paycheck stuff. Anything you want to add, Lupe? Um, also, the income verification for the client, it is very challenging because when we get um, the vouchers from the city in case if we're able to get something, we have to have some type of verification for the income in order for them to prove the clients is able to pay for the bills that they say the light, the water, the gas. That's one of the type of um, 
barriers that we encounter with the, our undocumented clients too. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, next slide, please. Um, the other challenge is uh, landlords um, t not, not willing to take the subsidies because they, um, they feel that they, can, they know that they can get more money um, by um, renting for market value um, than getting the uh, monies from subsidies. Uh, it's also been challenging finding landlords that accept um, uh, vouchers due to the um, rent. And the landlords don't really like the idea of having to go through the inspection. So uh, sometimes, you know, because there's rules and regulations for, uh, for Section 8, a lot of times the landlords don't want to have to go through the um, go through the rules and jump through hoops in order to uh, rent the place out. Um, there may be also also some landlords, you know, who are uh, um, I'm trying to think. Um, anyway, Lupe, you have, you might want to have something else to say about this because I can't think of it right off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, for the landlords, sometimes they don't want to accept the voucher because they can they might find some other um, people that they can rent it for a higher price or what the voucher is for. So it's more easy for them. Why do I have to go through inspection and all these things when I can get some other um, uh, person that can pay higher and I don't have to go through the rules of the city or the rules of the voucher. Mm -hmm through um, to get my apartment rent. So that's some of the barriers that we can find with the landlords. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then you have some landlords that just don't, they don't keep up their apartments. You know, they, they and they just, just want to rent out the apartment without having to fix them up like they should. Yeah. Um, with the city of Pasadena, we do have uh, well, they do have some incentive. With sometimes when we have to convince, try to convince our clients, or like we have some incentive pro uh, program that we can uh, give you some money so you can probably fix up your um, your place in order to be up to code with everything that we're asking. But that takes time, and then sometimes the landlords are like, "I need to rent my apartment right away." So there is. Uh, this is gonna take more time still, so it's very challenging. Next slide. Um, so resources that can help people living with HIV obtain stable housing. So definitely partnering, partnering with agencies who are hyper funded, um, agencies who offer rapid rehousing, um, agencies that work with vets as well. Um, that's another um, another resource that's, that, that can work in your favor. Um, agencies that have housing developments that are specific for people who are HIV positive. So out here in um, LA, Pasadena area, there are um, some organizations like, such as Project New Hope um, that have their own developments that are specifically for HIV positive individuals. Um, and those go like hotcakes, honey. And um, most of the time, the, <laughs> the people don't move out until either they, they move out or unless they pass away. And then that's when the apartments become available. So there's like a long wait list for those type of um, uh, apartments or buildings. And then also Alliance for Housing and Healing has their own developments as well. Um, that's specifically for HIV positive individuals. Uh, we've noticed, um, next slide. Okay. Um, so before I get to this, I wanted to just talk about a little bit about the COVID that's going on. Um, we've noticed that um, uh, s some of our clients who are still um, homeless, uh, it's really been hard to find um, housing now because um, the, the landlords are not willing to uh, rent. They don't want to, they don't want to, um, they don't want to like, uh, if they do have vacancies, they, they really don't want to have to engage with anybody because of, you know, what's going on. 
So uh, it's been hard to find um, landlords that's willing to uh, rent out their places that are that may become available. Um, so I have a couple of client cases I want to discuss. Uh, client number one, this particular client has been homeless in Pasadena for like two years, uh, sleeping in the elements. Uh, we linked him to Foothill Unity Center um, maybe like two years ago, but due to his criminal background, um, he didn't find housing right away. Um, and uh, it took about a year. And with the help of his housing navigator, the client and the client working together, finally they was able to find a landlord out in um, Long Beach that was willing to accept his subsidy. And also, of course, he ran his background. And because the background wasn't having to deal with um, manufacturing any type of drugs, it had to do with like uh, possession, um, the client, the landlord was willing to work with him. And so the client is currently housed and uh, as of May of 2020, and um, the client had been challenging um, as well because uh, while he was homeless, he didn't keep up with his uh, doctor's appointments and things like that. So, but now since he's gotten back housed, he's, he's on a roll again, he's, keep, he's keeping uh, engaging in his uh, uh, mental health as well as, as in his HIV care. So I'm really proud of him. Next slide. Um, Lupe, you wanna talk about this client? Yes, um, we had these clients that was on the streets of um, Pasadena and Arcadia. We, he was on, at the hospital like every week. The hospital they already knew him, that he was always there because he was out on the LMS. He was not taking care, he was not um, taking care of his um, status. He was not taking his medicine. So he was like every week at the hospital. So we were we were able to get connected to him. Um, we worked on getting his um, income back, his SSI. Uh, we were able to refer him to an SRO, and I was able to put him um, in the SRO right away. Not right away, but I mean, in a few months, uh, while he was getting back on care, while he was getting back um, his income. Now the client has been at uh, the Centennial Place in Pasadena for the last um, year, year and a half, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, he's doing really well. He is back on care. Uh, so um, he's doing really well with this program and he was able to get into house through this program. Um, so he was really thankful for that, this program that we were able to connect him to. Um, so, um, so the next client um, is funny because she was my client when I used to work at Women Alive, like, oh my God, <laughs> 17 years ago. <laughs> and um, I just happened to be at Union Station one day checking on somebody else. And then she was like, hey, I was like, oh my God, hi, what you doing here? Um, but anyway, she um, was referred from Huntington Hospital and um, she had been homeless um, for like over a year and uh, she had was incarcerated. <clears throat> and so she, um, once we got her connected to the HRSA program, I would say, hmm, Lupe, I think it was like maybe 30 or 60 days she was connected there, uh, a, uh, a, how a uh, housing came up with uh came up through alliance for housing and healing and i think after she was connected with hersa she was uh, maybe about 60 days something like that that's when it came became available and so um lupe jumped on it and um she's been housed of what since 2018 yes she was also staying at our shelter so i was able to work with her right away getting mm -hmm. all, all her documents together and everything right away. So it was a plus that she was already at our shelter. Mm. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and she 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 had all her documents, so she was ready. <laughs> and that's another challenge too. Um, and I'm sure uh, Lupe can can contest, and also uh, Kristen, is that you know it's, sometimes it's like pulling teeth, honey, trying to get these documents together with these clients, you know, because they feel like you know, we have to do everything. And it's like, no, these are your documents. These, you know, we need you to get these documents so you can get your housing. You know, like my new client I have now, she's, oh Lord, she just, <laughs> it's like pulling teeth. You know, it's like, girl, come on now. I'm housed. You know, I'm really, I'm housed. I'm good, but I'm, this is for you. You know, if you want to be housed, then this is the things you need to do. But um, some clients are, are, are good at getting on top of their things. And then some clients, they just kind of just like, uh, you know, because maybe, and I think it's because they've been homeless for a long time and they just haven't, haven't had to be responsible. So a lot of times it has to do with it. So that's just my, my soapbox. <laughs> um, next uh, slide, please. All right, so the lessons that we've learned is that um, clients do not always meet the housing subsidy and eligibility criteria uh, to employment services and supporting them increasing their income. So if for like the undocumented folks and then for those individuals who have like a criminal background that uh, consists of uh, sales or uh, manufacturing or sex offense, we uh, encourage them to like um, go through our employment services to get a job and also uh, to increase their income so that they can be able to pay for market rent. And um, also adding undocumented clients to flexible subsidies wait list uh, managed by our housing matcher. Next slide. And then I'll turn it back over to Serena. Thanks, Precious, and Lupe and Kristen for just sharing your experiences. Uh, uh, lots of creativity there uh, around how to leverage different resources for, like, a one lesson I heard was just clients have individualized needs and uh, different challenges, and you have to be really flexible um, and creative on how to address some of those barriers, and also organizational barriers. Uh, you, the, just getting the different paperwork together, the different organizations to work together for the clients. So um, really just want to say thank you for sharing those experiences. And I'm sure that there'll be some questions for you. Um, next slide, please. And thanks for all the work that you're doing too, being on the front lines. I know it takes a long time. Maybe during the discussion, you can talk about that, how long it actually takes to work with some of the clients to get housed that, and, and managing all these resources. Um, so just quickly, because um, we want to get to the discussion, is there are some overall lessons learned that we're seeing and emerging, for, uh, emerging from our initiative. So as you heard from Kristen, Lupe, and Precious, really starting at the beginning to look outside of HRSA and, and uh, Ryan White. There are HUD resources out there. There are city funds out there. There may be state funds out there that you could leverage. Um, to help your clients address their housing needs. So one of the key things that you heard from all and our partners are involved in is find out if you don't already have a partnership with your HOPWA um, agency, if you are not a HOPWA funded agency, reach out to them. That's really critical. Uh, another big message is um, we're finding is to really work closely with your HUD care continuum committee the and the coordinated entry system. Uh, you heard that from Precious and and Lupe, how they work together with, in Pasadena on that, um, but also in Boston, Kristen has had success there. So um, that's another critical group that you want to work at a system level with to get housing needs for your clients. Um, on the individual challenges that, that you've heard from our, our panelists here, you know, really looking to provide letters of support for clients, working, you're gonna have clients who probably have criminal history backgrounds that can be challenging to get housing, but there may be some ways to work with landlords um, and address some of those issues. So you may need to provide some support and, and work with people, get, get um, some, understand what their history is so you know what types of housing resources they'll be available for. 
um, the need to look for people who you may need um, support for addiction recovery, substance abuse, mental health services. Uh, so looking for um, putting them in a situation where they can have supportive housing as well um, to help and connect them to those services might also be key. And then um, as you also heard from our panelists, working directly with landlords um, and finding landlords who will be willing to take um, vouchers and, and there may be challenges as we heard from Precious about in this COVID time um, and restrictions, but there are landlords out there and, and maybe private real estate. Um, I know some of the other sites in our demonstration and uh, demonstration sites have had some success there. So looking to form those relationships directly with landlords and real estate people are really critical as well. Uh, next slide. And then, um, I mean, my, our experts here have um, really shared some lessons on working with clients that have many challenges. But as we heard, they have made, been able to work with clients, not turned any clients away, well, having open communication with clients to really understand what their background is, their history, what their documentation. We heard from Precious, what, what documents do you need? And staying on them and working with them and empowering them to to bring those documents so that they can get the housing. Um, you may need to do some work with agencies um, about housing first um, and work with clients where an appropriate housing might be for them. Uh, uh, Lupe and uh, Precious talked about um, clients who maybe not be documented and that there's limited supportive um, federal resources for them, but looking at models of shared housing, looking at what they can afford and finding um, appropriate shared housing for them so that they can pay that, um, pay rent as needed. Um, holding clients accountability um, and, and following up with them to make sure that they are paying their rent, that they are getting, if they need additional assistance, that they're filing the paperwork that's needed um, is important. Um, and, and finding and, and establishing reasonable expectations for clients. What can they do in that period? What resources do they have? Um, are they ready to be housed? Some might not be ready to go into a permanent housing situation. So um, in the discussion, we can talk a little bit more about that, about how long it might take, particularly people who've come from a history of chronic homelessness. It might be harder to get them into uh, and ready for a housing and living on their own because it's a different way of being and, and that might need to take time. So um, these are some of the things we've heard so far. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have some other, um, the, at the bottom of the screen, we have a link here for to our website where we're sharing resources about our SPINS initiative um, that you can take a look and, and get more information there. Uh, right now, I just want to thank you and thank our panelists for sharing all their great um, experience. We will now, um, this is our contact information. So if you want to reach out and get some more specific questions from either Kristen, Precious, Guadalupe about their, how they're working in their areas and get advice, or if you want to uh, write to me about our initiative, happy to do that as well. Um, we will now, um, next slide, I think there's one more. We'll now move into our live discussion and question sections um, for any further questions that uh, you may all may have for our panelists. Thanks so much for your time.